from giant, giant tarantula and all that. You know, that was one of the first things that I remember seeing in a horror movie. And, um, and then, of course, the movie Arachnophobia. So my dad liked to instill that fear on me as a little joke, and it really took hold. Um, I used to love spiders as a kid, but before he started doing that, that, that all changed. I had a bunch of spider books that I, I recall. I, I was like five or six, and um, I had all these little spider books about spiders from all over the world, and they weren't like kids' books. It wasn't like a child story it was informative stuff and um i used to be interested in them back then and and then the fear set in over time as you know what in rome like most people are scared of spiders so they teach others to be scared of spiders also and that's how i learned to be scared of spiders um i was about 21 22 and i was at work and i found a jumping spider and it was the first time i've ever seen one in alaska i didn't even know we had them up here and curiosity was like re-sparked and I took it home with me and I watched it and had it for about two weeks and, and then it, it passed away as the one that was supposed to be up here but in that time that I had it, it my perspective on spiders completely changed um they were especially jumping spiders they, they're a little different but you know they had a curious habit to them and they like to be looking at things if it moved they wanted to look at it like what was that you know and They'd play with laser pointers and, and they were just curious and i was like man they're, they're kind of like a kitten stuck in a spider body you know and and i started seeing them as as not scary you know jumping spiders don't have the long slender legs the the whole thing that we are associated with with fear of spiders just the slender sleek bodies the big bulbous abdomens and the glistening eyeballs and um what you don't know you fear being a being a human that's usually what we do and so i decided to you know start learning about them again you know i remembered i like them as a kid so i can do this this is again um that was a very slow process for me because i was so busy working and doing other things but i was still when i had the opportunity to I would, you know, learn about some spider that I saw and be like, what was that? What kind is this? I need to learn more about it. I'm not just going to look at it and be like, oh, that's a cool spider. I wanted to know more. Um, and I one day found a Facebook group and it was North American Spiders. And I just started learning from there. Uh, met some people on that group and... And we've been friends for a couple of years now and I've learned from them and come to find out a lot of them are actually entomologists and aeronologists and they've got credentials and I, I was learning from the pros and everything that I knew was actually wrong. Um, so I started learning correct facts about spiders at that point, not just stuff that you Google because a lot of the stuff you find on Google is grossly incorrect, um, especially when it comes to brown recluse. That's the, the big one. And we're going to touch on that in a little bit. Um, So years go by, about years of that, and then I'm like, there's no group for Alaskan spiders, so why don't I start this, you know? And, and it was mainly to help people identify them, um, but I also I started hearing the myth about the brown recluse in Alaska. I'm like, well, that's, why would they be up here? Uh, that makes no sense, and I've never seen one. So let me, let me start this group to help share spiders and also to you know, get pictures in to see if there actually is a brown recluse here. Um, as the group's been up for three and a half years, I think, or four years, and there's never been a single brown recluse ever posted. Every single suspected one has been something else. And um, I started seeing what the group was doing for people and helping them. And that's when I realized, like, man, I really actually got to stick with this and keep on going with it and helping people because it's making an impact. It's changing how people are thinking about spiders when, you know, they are very misconstrued, like, especially in Alaska. It's insane how, how Alaska differs in their spider myths from down in the States. Um, there are some, some common occurrences of, of myths, but... The, the, there are some that are it's just hilarious and i'm not even going to bring them up because they're, they're yeah inappropriate um 
but it's it's been a fun journey from being scared of even looking at a picture of a spider to holding every spider that I see now. Like, seriously, if I see a spider outside, I will, if it's not in its web or its nest, I'm not going to force it out. But if it's out on its own wandering around, I'll gladly pick it up. I have no worries about it. Um, I will not handle the collection of spiders that I have, though. Uh, a lot of them were given to me. And they are very medically significant from around the world. And I don't feel like, no, nah, I'll just pass on that for right now. When I get more comfortable and more experienced in those species, then maybe. Um, but yeah, it, just being immersed in the, uh, in the spider field has greatly helped everything about me and overcoming my fear of spiders. And after all, knowledge is power. And I somehow am now where I am doing this <laughs> from being scared to death of spiders to teaching about spiders so uh a lot can happen and like this gross change happened just in about five years so we're quite a 180 um i i guess that the biggest thing that kept influencing me was other people's curiosity you know they they wanted me to to keep answering their questions and that keep that kept me having more questions for myself also trying to get more detailed answers to give them gave me more answers than i did have before that prior to them asking so it was it's constantly a learning process i'm i i still make errors there's still stuff i i do not know about spiders um i've never actually been in college for learning aeronology um it's just solely from people that i've met that have credentials and my interest to learn from them and them actually going through and teaching me for free so i'm very appreciative of that and i'm paying it forward i don't ask for a dime back i don't want one i just want people to, to learn the facts about spiders and learn that every spider in alaska is beneficial and nothing that we have up here is harmful and wants to bite you and doesn't bite you unless you hurt it so that's like the big spiel there oh my background i guess um i i think that the news did make a a good impact on everything um but there was there was like 50 minutes of the interview the, during the interview timing that weren't even aired and it was some very key information that I really wish would have been aired also but they they wanted a, a lighter piece not so informative and straight in your face so maybe one day they'll air that stuff later on um, I guess I can't hear anybody so if anybody's talking I have no idea um, but I want to add, you know, you guys can ask questions as we're going on. Um, but yeah, if you guys can unmute yourselves and, uh, you know, I've got some pop-ups up here that I'm just going to browse over while we're talking and I hope that you can see them also. Yeah. Here, one person. But yeah, if anybody's got some questions, go ahead, unmute yourself. I have a question. And ask away. Um, we're going to be talking about brown clues. Oh, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I've heard a lot about the brown recluse, but that's not my question. So if it's not a good time, I, I won't. Oh, no, it's okay. I was, I'm, I I'm interested in your Carolina wolf spider. Okay. Do you know about that one? Uh, it looks that, huge. She is about four inches, including leg span. Um, she is very... Uh, a common spider down in Carolina, which is in the Carolina areas, which is why they're named after that. Uh, but they also spread out from there. Um, we do not have any hognos up here in Alaska. They're, they're giant wolf spiders. Uh, let me bring up the window. Here. Yeah, ours are small. Actually, we just go over here. Wolf spiders. Okay. Go to 
to the list of spiders and go to the genus of Hogna. So Hognas, almost all of these wall spiders we do not have in Alaska. Um, we have about seven, if I remember, seven or eight genus up here. Um, but each of those genus have different species. Uh, so we've got about, I, I would roughly estimate 60 to 80 different species of wolf spider, but only in eight genus. Hmm. Um, and the Hogna carolensis is one of the most beautiful ones, in my opinion. They have these very broad markings. You guys can see the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, the screen on here. Um, Bug Guide is one of your best sources. Uh, this is how I learned to ID on my own. Um, it takes a long time, but once you find out what is not in Alaska, that helps you narrow down the list. And um, having the GBIF site is another good help because that tells you actual locations of what species, whereas Bug Guide is a little lacking in that area. They, they're better off on a taxonomy and images and um, a little bit of other aspects there. But photos, photos, photos here. Hogna carolinensis. I don't know too much about them. This is a beauty. But you're um, learning. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning a little bit about them because, yeah, the... the email that I have here. I've, I've got to learn more about it just because of what they are. Um, let's go to a wolf spider that we do have here in Alaska, and that is going to be the most common one is the Pardosa, which you'll see me say that in my group all the time is, oh, it's a Pardosa, it's a Pardosa, it's a Pardosa. It's, there are so many Pardosas that they are the most dominant wolf spider on there. Uh, in North America that I know of. There's, there's, they're everywhere. And they're small. Um, a lot of them look almost exactly the same. That's why when I ID them, I leave it at just Pardosa genus, and I don't try and go on the species, because as you can see where my cursor is, this is a lot of times the only way that you can um, ID them, and that is microscopic examination of the pedipalps or epigene, which the male pedipalps are the folds. Actually, there's a little pop up there. You can see it says pedipalp, Pardosa distinct in male. Um, and the females is this. This is the epigene. The, uh, the, it's, not a, it's not a vaginal thing. It's similar to, but it's called an epigene. One of the big ones that we have up here is Pardosa mackenziana. I think that's These girls are everywhere, and boys. These ones are the ones that you'll see most commonly up here in Alaska. Um, we also have other species that look very similar, but they're more or often away from where humans are, like out in the tundra or the wooded areas. Um, so villagers might see them more often out, anywhere outside of the Anchorage, any, any metropolitan area, really. So maybe Fairbanks might have them around there. We've got so many wolf spiders up here. So when I was learning about wolf spiders, um, you, you learn to identify their robustness. You know, they're, they look hardy. They've got these thick, broad, muscular looking legs. They've got the faces. They always have two forward facing eyes. Um, in Pardosas, the eyes are a little more outwards. So it kind of makes them look a little funny. They look a little wonky eyed, um, pretty comical. And Pardosa wolf spiders, their sete is what they're called. The hairs on their legs will be quite longer and they're able to detect vibrations in the air. Um, these hairs also detect pressure applied to them. Um, so if you, squeeze them a certain amount, those hairs are the ones that tell them whether or not they're in danger. And if, if they're being pressed hard enough, they will respond with a bite. Um, that is solely just in a self-defense mechanism. I mean, 
us being people, if we were being held against our will, we're going to fight back too, right? Same goes with animals, especially spiders and arthropods. One of the most successful organisms out there. Um, so Intelligene, Intelligene A is the order of spiders. And that's all spiders are in this, they're chelicerates. Um, chelicerates can also include scorpions and centipedes um, and all sorts of other arachnid arthropods. But in the spiders, they are intelligent, eh? the true spider. Um, these do not include mygalomorphs. Mygalomorphs are tarantulas and such, and that would be back in, um, back in the spiders there. Now, bug guide is funny because it says that we do not have grass spiders up here, even though we do. Because they're not like they um, we have plenty of Tegenaria up here. Tegenaria domestica <coughs> is our imposter brown recluse. Many people believe it to be a brown recluse because of solely the shape on the back of their head. The top of their head is called the The whole head is called the cephalothorax. The underside is called the sternum. Um, but a lot of people believe that on top of the cephalothorax that this is a violin shape. You've got the hollow part and then you've got the actual violin on the outside, but this is incorrect. An actual Loxosceles reclusa, the violin, is much more pronounced. That's a blurry picture. One second. Image of the violin. So these are brown recluse. We don't have them in Alaska. There's never been one seen in Alaska. I currently am the only one with any in Alaska. I purchased them especially to teach people about them. This is a very malnourished female. She has not eaten in a long time has not had access to water. This bent tibia right here is actually an indication of malnutrition. So she has not been eating in a while. So both of these tibias are bent. Um, but the violin marking you see is very pronounced, dark, has the stem even, and you can see closely, it even looks like strings going across. And they only have six eyes. They have three sets of two. So there's one pair, two pair, and three pair. Um, the occurrences of them have been pretty much everywhere central and west of their natural habitat. They have not been found in Alaska or even near Alaska whatsoever. They do not range past the Rocky Mountains west. Um, there has been a couple errants, but the vagrants are usually dead upon arrival in the western coastline area. And a lot of times they just don't count them because it's a stowaway that has absolutely no way to populate and was dead upon arrival. Um, in Alaska's case of brown recluse, um, <laughs> I found out that it was a pest control agency that's been spreading the rumor saying that we have them up here. And um, I'm not going to say the name of them, but they have been spreading them since the 80s because they misinterpreted a brown recluse spider for a Tegenaria domestica. They, they thought it was brown recluse, but um, they sent three specimens to Washington State University's entomology lab, and they said that they were confirmed, not the lab. The um, pest control agency said that they were, were confirmed brown recluse, and I researched upon that, and they were not. No. So that's 
where the myth started and I found out that they have been trained in a broad spectrum for just all of North American spider treatments and that's why they were saying it up here but then they had this opportunity to really reinforce it because here they have three brown spiders that they don't know what they are they're not from Alaska they're just starting up up here and it's a it's a good way to profit hey there's brown recluse in your house we need to exterminate we need to spray um so we've been working that ploy for a while and they've been profiting off of a lot of people people and uh, a while since anybody that I've heard of has had a spray for brown recluse um, but it just says spiders now but I'm actually looking for anybody that has a receipt that states on the receipt that they got sprayed for having a brown recluse population in their home I don't want to see pictures of, I don't know let's get out of here I don't want ads of toilet and stuff um uh, let's go to the hobo spider so the hobo spider is another myth that we have up here. Um, people think that we've got hobo spiders in Alaska, which again is not, it's the Tegenaria domestica, the barn funnel weaver. They look very similar, but if you look here on the uh, abdomen and the carapace, you'll notice that they have a, a like a swished pattern, whereas the uh, Tegenaria domestica has a herringbone and it's more squared. And Tegenaria domestica always has striped legs. So there's always striped legs. Um, the hobo spider has no striped legs. They're usually light colored. Um, their pattern is very bland. They're a little smaller and they range from Oregon, Washington, and then east and south there and they are actually a very common spider in europe area and there's been there's been no issues over there um with them and the myth about them being a very dangerous spider isn't caused from human error it's because of a report that was done about the effects of their venom on lab mice and what the effects of the lab mice had, and they feared that that would be on humans also, but they were never to do a, able to do a clinical trial on humans at that time. So they still stated it as if it was a dangerous spider. Same with sack spiders. Um, but they have since also taken both of those off of the CDC most dangerous spiders list um, for medically significant because they have had testing finally done on both of them and found that neither of them are actually harmed. At all, their their venom is purposeful, benign. It, it does nothing in ninety nine percent of cases. Um, I guess I can stop again now for some questions. If anybody's got questions, uh, you would have to unmute yourself to ask a question first, though. But if you've got questions, I will stop talking for a little bit. Hi, my name is Sue, and I have a question. Hey there, how's it going? Okay, are there any spiders that can survive outside? Do they have adaptations like wood frogs do of, of lowering their, their body temperature and filling their cells with glucose? Is there any adaptation that they have to living outside? In so there are. Um, yes, um, there are six species that are confirmed in Alaska so far of spiders that are able to actually freeze solid um, completely solid, just like the wood frog. They um, also have evolved what are called AFPs, which are antifreeze proteins, a type of glycol, um, not necessarily glycol, but it is a, a similar uh, property as glycol where it doesn't allow for absolute freezing. Um, and so in the spider's hemolymph, which is their blood and also their movement fluid, which helps them move around, um, 
these spiders <clears throat> have these AFPs in their blood proteins so that when they are in this hostile environment and they're unable to find any kind of shelter, which spiders usually go under cracks of barks or houses um, under wood piles and such, if they they don't have that opportunity to go high in time up here in Alaska. It just snowed overnight. So these spiders are at risk of being frozen and dying. So they've evolved to be able to take on that freezing abuse, freeze solid. And when the opportunity presents itself, that they get warm again, that they can thaw and go find shelter, which is a reason that you see spiders a lot of times crawling on the surface of snow, usually around like December through March-ish, where we get those warm random days. And uh, you'll see spiders, and that's because a lot of them are stuck on tree limbs and fall out. They were frozen to the tree limb, um, and then they fall out when it's warm enough, and they're trying to climb somewhere that walks up there safe for them. Um, a lot of the a lot of the spiders that have them up here are the Pardosa spiders, um, the wolf spiders um, that I was talking about earlier. Um, some of our other ones, like the Tegenaria domestica, might have them. They don't know for sure, but it seems like it. Um, what do we got? Our te uh, Tetragnathidae, the long-jawed orb weavers, also. So, um, Anoplognathus, uh, one species of that has it, and uh, a few of our Tumicidae, so uh, a couple of the crab spiders and the Philodromidae, the, the Zistitus and the running crab spiders. Those are also able to freeze solid and come back to life once it's an appropriate temperature. Um, the temperature freezing range for these AFPs vary from the species of spider. Um, and it seems that the further north you go, the more extreme temperature they can survive. And, and some of them can survive up to 80 below, you know, some even almost 90, it's, it's between 80 and 90 below. Um, we definitely be dead, but they can they can be exposed and complete exposure to that and thaw and walk away like nothing happened. Um, but most of them range between negative thirty and negative seventy. Um, but a lot of spiders that don't have these AFPs, uh, nature takes its course, survival of the fittest and all. And if they can't hide, then they didn't make it most of the time. Uh, but who knows? Maybe in the future they evolve AFPs also. Things are things change consistently. Is that a good answer to the question? Yeah, that's great. I was wondering um, how they maintain if they if their only options were seeking shelter or if they could actually stiff it out in Alaska like the Port of the Wood Frogs do. So now, yeah. since the Wood Frog has might been my favorite Alaska animal, so now I have to add spiders to that. That's totally awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, of course. Um, does anybody else have any other questions about uh, what we've been recently touching on? Or should I move on to uh, myths, spider myths and misconceptions? Any more questions? So I have a question. My name's Kathy. Okay. Um, it's kind of related to Sue's question. Is there the like the the um, oh what is it called? It's a little black one you find in your house, a cobweb spider. Okay. If I if I relocate those outside, am I am I killing them in the winter? Uh, Are there any spiders that you could kill by relocating outside from your house? A lot of them can. Um, a lot of the spiders that you find in your house are there because they rely on humans. They're synanthropic. Syn um, okay. And they, humans and those spiders coexist together, like the, the barn funnel spider and the, the Steatota borealis, the, the common black little house spiders that you find usually in a corner or your cupboard. Um, those ones are more adapted to being inside of domiciles. Um, okay. They, they usually can kind of survive like it, it, right now they can survive i have at these temperatures but i believe anything below zero will start affecting them more 
um, more extremely. Um, but those spiders, uh, what they all they really want in your house is the bugs that are going to be crawling through your carpet that you don't see, um, all the ones in your walls that you don't see. Uh, and, and they're just there to help you keep your house clean of bugs, really. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That answers my question. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I have a question, Keith. Any other um, right now? Yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the many species of orb weavers we have up here. I think they're fascinating. Oh, um, do you have a specific one that you want to talk about or just any? Well, I'm just, um, I'm interested on, in how many different, um, different kinds we have. And then I really am interested in the fierce. I think they're pretty interesting. So if you can talk a little yeah. bit about those, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, let's actually bring that girl up. So, Orb weavers are a uh, very prominent species here. This is one of my favorites. And I'll back up a bit green and white. So orb weavers in Alaska, um, they do not have AFPs. Almost all of them don't, except for larenoids. Um, which is a weird, they're an odd, odd bird weaver. So, as you can see, there's a lot of them, 3,500 species worldwide. Now, in Alaska, we've got we, the only large orb weaver genus that we have up here is Arrhenius. Now, we have small one, the Arenella. We do have Echinthopyria, which are mountain orb weavers. Um, and there's no list. Where's the rest of that list? Why does it stop at C? Um, we have the Hypsosinga, which is a very, very tiny, small, small little orb weaver, smaller than your pinky nail, um, which looks a lot like the uh, Hypsolestes um, pygmaea, or Hypsolestes florens, the dwarf, splendid dwarf spider, except that the uh, Hypsosinga pygmaea is just a little bit bigger and it doesn't have turret eyes on the top of its head. So. It takes a close examination and the roundness of the abdomen versus the uh, obligation of it is another factor. So it's a little harder to dispel those two. Um, Arenella species, we've got Displicata up here, which is this guy. They're, they're easier to recognize. They've got the six spots on their abdomen. Um, Arenella Displicata, uh, their common name is the six spotted orb weaver. Even though Displicata doesn't mean that, it means dispersed because they are dispersed all over. As you can see, they are in almost every state in US and all of um, We also have Arenella proxima. Um, proxima can be a little bit harder to differentiate than Displicata because they can look almost the same when they're green. Now, if it's reddish colored, it's almost always Displicata. If it's greenish and it has four dots or eight dots, it's usually going to be either a proxima or a, um, um, oh man, I am a brain fart in it. There's one more. Uh, uh, starts with an H. Or no, no. That one was, is an errant one we don't get very often. It usually blows it on treatment, so I'll just go over that one completely. So we'll, so we'll go back to the orb weavers here in Alaska, the Arrhenius. And we've got, um, let's go to the list. Browse our list. It's a beautiful one. It's up here. None of those are in Alaska, unfortunately. So this one, the Cavaticus, this is actually what spider um, Charlotte from Charlotte's Web is. She's a bond spider. So that's her. We unfortunately don't have them in Alaska. Our most common one is the marbled orb weaver, but we also have Arrhenius diadematus, the cross orb weaver, also known as the European garden spider. 
um, the morph that we see more is this morph here. If I get this morph here, it can kind of look like a marbled orb weaver mixed with a, a shamrock orb weaver. Um, sometimes they can be pretty hard to, to ID, um, especially when it comes to the smaller ones like um, the Groenlandica here. It looks a lot like a shamrock orb weaver, except that it's a little smaller and it's got a little slightly different ventral markings. But it's still very difficult to identify there. We do have Arrhenius Ivei. These girls are pretty cool. The males look a lot like the cross orb weaver males, except they lack a lot of the pattern and they have a lot longer um, carapace. So uh, that's three for Alaska here. And we have Marmaris. <clears throat> And down in lower 48, this is one of the comic for their marmaris, uh, these black and yellow. Really weird for us Alaskans to see this one because it's just like, what is that spider? <laughs> but ours look like these ones here. We get these markings a lot, more marmoration to it, um, more coloration. We've got, we got purple, uh, I've seen pinkish hues. Um, deep reds, uh, and of course the yellow is orange. Um, they get pretty, pretty beautiful, and they're one of the largest marble door weavers up here in Alaska. And these, all of our marble door weavers in Alaska have a huge impact on the flying insect population by keeping them extremely, uh, uh, What's the word? Level. I, I'm, I missed my lunch today. Um, a balanced. <laughs> Let's see here. Go back. Back. It's one of the unfortunate things. We're good. So Marmaris, Marble Lord Weaver, our most common one up here. Um, getting there to save us. We're almost there to the fierce sword weaver. Um, Normani is one of our largest ones. Um, they can get bigger in all around size, including leg span than the Marble Lord Weaver. Um, their webs can be sometimes two feet in diameter up to, uh, not including their support lines, which have been several feet long. So the humps on the Nordmani and the Savis are very distinguishable compared to other fighters that you see in Alaska where they have their round abdomen. They don't have these horns. Or I, I don't know the actual name for them. I've never actually been able to find a, a paper that has a name for those two humps. So I call them shoulder humps. Um, both the Arrhenius Nordmani and the Arrhenius Savis have this white splash heart line and they will both have this pattern. What separates them the first place is Nordmani's pattern has a it is just a connection. It's a big hole. Arrhenius Savis won't be connected and it will be triangle patterns where the color won't be the same all throughout and it'll look like um, disconnected chevrons um, and the coloration of the legs will be different. But when they get to be both black and white, they can be sometimes a little difficult to distinguish because they'll have the, uh, the, the odd pattern like this where you see it's a bit not connected, but the black lines are where you're looking, and they are actually still connected. So it is a still connected line, and that's how you will be able to separate your Savis from your Norton Mani fastest. Um, took me years to do this stuff, and this site is what I did. I would get on here, and I'd be looking and reading, and took 
you know, just doing everything that I could to learn how to, to separate spiders and ID them. Um, here's the Savis. This is the fierce sword believer, which is funny because Savis doesn't translate to fierce, it translates to cruel. But I guess they don't want to have a, a cruel spider going around out there and scaring everybody. Um, one of the more common morphs for this one in other areas other than Alaska is this one that kind of looks like it's wearing a bra. Um, but this is an Arrhenius Savis. Their splash is more of a, a, like a pen mark and not a paintbrush. So it doesn't have have like stray markings going out of it. Um, their triangular pattern is not connected. This is a real bad picture, but you can kind of see there that it, it does not connect. So you'll see that they're they're seg segmented and by themselves. Um, and the leg coloration is a little different. These are a little darker all throughout versus Normani, which have a bit more white. And um, so the white rotting on the tibia here will be a little longer um so you'll get you'll get some darker more here you go lots of light on this one this makes it very hard but you're going to notice the tan so normani doesn't have tan the tan marking is is pretty indicative of an Arrhenius savus um but even if it can have the the lots of white markings all over it you've got to do the fine you know, look at the finer details and see that tan marking there is, is one of the bigger separations at the male. Side above. So you can see that the triangular pattern are not touching. And the white line is very small, doesn't spread. Um, they're they're pretty, pretty interesting looking spiders. Um, they're all harmless. They get very, very large. Um, even the info in here is not very informative. There's not much to know about these things. Um, but you can also get the light morph, which can be pretty odd because it it will start to look a little bit like an Uranus gemoids, which is an out of out of Alaskan spider. Um, but then once again, you've got the triangles patterns, and that's where you're doing. Oh, it's not. It's not that. That's a light more savus. Um, we'll back to you, spiders. So Keith, can I interrupt you for just a second? Go ahead. Can you can you talk about how these um, how these do in the winter, or how do they do they hibernate, or do they um, um, how does that how do they continue growing <laughs> coming uh, this, back? This every certain summer? species or all orb weavers that appear? <laughs> oh, um, whatever answer you'd like to give, I guess. Um, okay, well, it can be any of the orb weavers. I just think they're so big and they're they stand out so much that they're catching people's eye. And it's just such an interesting thing. We used to have one that lived on our yeah. deck and then we re replaced our deck and now it's gone. And I've found, now we have one, we have a fierce that kind of guards our front door, which is very cool. <clears throat> I just like to know what's gonna happen to her in the winter. If I need to try to relocate her, I mean, or just let her, I mean, I, I feel like we need to let nature do its thing. So probably leave her where she is, but um, you know, how do, how do they weather up here? What do they do in the winter? Um, so when it comes to spiders that can't, um, they can't go into the uh, the freeze stasis and freeze solid with the AFPs. Uh, you'll notice that Arrhenius savus and also Arrhenius normani, uh, they are strictly a northern hemisphere spider for North America. Um, they are more adapted to the cold. That's why they have these hairier setes here, more setes, but they've also got the added um, extra burly hairs all over them that helps to be an insulator. Um, they are one of the last spiders, to my knowledge, uh, for orb eaters especially, they are one of the last ones to go out and go look for shelter. This is actually a picture right here of a Savus out on the, the ground, and um, it 
and usually if you see a spider walking on the ground like this, they A, had their web replaced um, or destroyed, or, you know, they got displaced from it, or B, they are going to look for somewhere to take shelter for the winter because they feel that the temperature has shifted, um, or they're just looking for somewhere else because they're not getting bugs at that one spot, but they usually don't move that far especially if there's light nearby. Light sources attract spiders, which attract, you know, the, versa versa. Light sources attract bugs, which attract spiders to eat those bugs. So if you got a porch light, you're gonna have a, uh, you're gonna have bugs and you're gonna get a spider eventually. Um, those spiders, if they find a good spot, will try to overwinter in that area so that they can go back to that spot. So if you've got uh, an orb weaver that you want to stay there and if she's, or where he isn't old enough, um, they're going to do it themselves. They're going to drop down. They're going to go find some leaf litter or a crack in the wall or something to go hibernate in. Um, if you do find an orb weaver in your home at this time, in the fall of time, put it outside. Let, let it do its thing. Um, they're not going to survive in your house in the winter unless you supply it with food, which is, it's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, because they could be there one day and then you go to work and then they've decided to move somewhere else the next day. Um, and it's it's not really a good thing to try and contain an orb weaver because that would be a huge enclosure. Um, so at this point, usually with orb weavers is definitely just let it, let them, let them do their thing. Um, they're gonna, they have the evolutionary know-how to, to survive through it. They've done it way before humans have been around and, um, uh, you know, 124 million years is, is the first spider, so they've been around forever. And uh, um, if if you've got that new deck, there, it's probably on deck. Um, it, that's a good spot for it to shelter if it can get between cracks or, or around it. Um, that's one good place that they go to. Um, uh, I always try and encourage people to not rake a section of their yard or leaf blows uh, like a bit of their yard because that is where insects take shelter spiders and insects from the from the winter elements and having somewhere for them to you know basically have a hideout for the winter is a very good thing to have because that prolongs the life of your gardens and your lawns and your trees and your yard and the healthiness of the area around you to have an equal and stable habitat um, and ecosystem. So it, interfering in that and, and trying to take the spider out of the web and like putting it somewhere else will probably um, stress it out and it might not want to go into a stasis uh, or diapause, which is what it's called, where, where they hibernate is diapause. Um, but yeah, when it comes to other spiders, it's a different case, like running crab spiders. Sure, you can bring those inside. They're going to be in their house all winter long anyways. Um, if they do get outside, it's the same story. They'll, they'll find somewhere to hide. Um, but having somewhere provided for them isn't, you know, a necessity because they're going to find somewhere anyways. Um, but yeah, just, just let nature do its course and don't try and interfere with it. They, they know what they're doing. Um, some spiders will co fully cocoon themselves once they find a place under the ground and um, they get under a good little leaf litter and before the first snow they'll cocoon themselves around it um, like sack spiders they'll get like leaf curling especially but even before it starts snowing they'll encase themselves in a leaf from a tree that they know is going to fall off and they completely enclose it and that falls off and that gets covered with other leaves and such and then the snow on top that so they're they're nice and insulated and they stake it out through winter. Um, some spiders live in rocks and they just do the same thing. They, they cover it with more debris and and uh, help do the insulation there. Um, and a lot of spiders do just they die off. They aren't able to find a place to hide. So nature takes its course. Um, survival of the fittest, and that's really a big thing about spiders. The toughest one survive, and there's a saying: if you see a spider in your house out in the open, they're not the smart.
Um, let's go to the myths, unless we have any other questions for right now. Here, but if anybody else has a question to ask here, go ahead and shoot. But yeah, there's about uh, about 14 um, or weaver species in Alaska. Give or take. Some of them are very small species. And we've also got the oddball Zygala. Uh, those are really weird. They're just an odd, odd taxon of spider there. They're pretty cool. They're an orb weaver. Um, and the Acupliera. The mountain orb weavers, they make huge webs. Um, then uh, the smaller, the Arenella and the Hypsisinga, they make tiny little orb weavers or little orb webs. Um, usually under like a leaf or a couple leaves, like an inch to four inches wide, little tiny. Um, but for miss and Misconception. So, biggest myth here, we've got about, what, 14 people on here? 13 people? Um, has anybody that is watching or listening, has anybody here heard the story of somebody that they know getting bit by a brown recluse? Yes, we all have. And, um, I grew up with that myth. Um, Everybody's growing up with that myth up here. Um, I've been, I've talked to hospitals, I've talked to pest control companies, I've talked to homeowners, I've, I've talked to a plethora of organizations up here, and I'm getting so many mixed reviews about, you know, someone saying that they've got a brown recluse infestation and then another person saying that they don't and then oh they, this person was bit by a spider oh it must have been a brown recluse the doctor said so such and such and such and such um not a single one of these cases has there ever actually been a brown recluse spider ever retrieved or photographed or even evidence of one anywhere um so it's it's the most empty myth in alaska that I've ever come across. Um, Bigfoot's a bigger myth up here. That's that's more, I believe, Bigfoot before I believe brown recluse in Alaska. Yep. Um, except for my two brown recluse. That doesn't count, though. Um, <laughs> the myth just keeps going, and it's uh, usually spurred on by an injury. You know, somebody... Uh, has a wound on them and they're like, oh, a spider bit me. Oh, it must have been a brown recluse because it's getting worse. Uh, so Going to have to rewind there and go, oh, how did you get that injury? Did you see it happen? Do you remember it? Did you see what caused that? You know, if you didn't see a spider, the chances that it was a spider are extremely slim because spiders, uh, their bite, it hurts. You know, I've been bit twice. Uh, both times were on accident. Uh, my fault. Um, the first time was a marbled orb weaver. Uh, I was about 14, 15, and I was at my friend's house and at his front door, and I I don't know what happened. It must have been trying to build its web at that time, but she dropped down and went into my shirt, and uh, I had a collared shirt on at the time, and I just felt tickling on my chest, so I brushed it, not knowing what it was, and then it, it, it felt like a little burn, um, and I got bit, and it fell out of my shirt, and it was a big marble orb weaver, um, and, you know, didn't really do anything, nothing, nothing happened, I got a slight headache, a little bit of nausea, a little bit of pain in that area, um, but nothing ever happened, just cleaned the injury, and went about my business. Um, later on, when I was so about four years ago, about four years ago, I was working. This is when, when I really kind of started going into the spider stuff. And I knew exactly what spider had bit me when I looked at it. But it was crawling on me at some point. And I worked at the airport and I had my hospital badge, or my airport, <laughs> my airport access badge on my left arm. And it was summertime. And I just, I, I was smoking a cigarette. I don't smoke anymore. But uh, I was smoking a cigarette and um, it felt 
a, a tickle and I moved my arm and just in that process of moving my arm I got bit and I lifted up my airport badge and it was just the littlest little red spider and I was able to see markings on its abdomen and I'm like, oh man it's a little triangulate cobweb spider and it was a tiny little thing and it died um the marbled orb weaver didn't die when when I brushed it it, it lost a leg but this one definitely died um and it felt like a cigarette burn also it was it was a pretty big burn there but um those are the only two times i've been bit by a spider and i've got to say that a bee sting is definitely a lot worse i've been stung by a bee quite a few times and i'd rather get bit by a spider than stung by a bee the alaskan spider not my hog my pair one it's got huge things i don't wish that on me um but um yeah, uh, it, the, another another myth is um, people getting bit in their sleep. You know that like spiders don't bite people in their sleep. Um, we've got the myth that that um, that they hunt humans when we're so that they want our breath. They they go into our mouths when we're sleeping. It's a nice hiding cave. Um, so there's there's all these myths that are just too funny. Um, they don't go into your mouth they don't they do like moist areas but they don't want your mouth it, they, they know you're a, a not a safe place to to go so you don't eat spiders um that is a myth you don't eat seven or whatever the number is you don't eat that many in your life um it, it would be a, such a rare off chance that it would have to be a male in search of a female and just so happen to go crawling across your face when your mouth is open and it go into your mouth and then you chew it and then you have to swallow it so i mean it, there's just more to it it's it's not believable um about them biting you at, when you're asleep that they don't feed off of humans there's no species of spider on earth that goes after a human like actively searches to go feed off our blood there's just none nothing no spider um you might get bit if it's in your bed only if you were to have rolled on it and pinched it or you were in the process of killing it but in that it's still even very hard because their fangs are oriented in a certain position and when they're crawling you know nine times out of ten they are level in their hairs the set day i was talking about on their legs those are also their equilibrium um it, it tells them which direction they are so upside down right side up um so they you depend on those hairs for their orientation and um when they're in their in a bed most spiders unless it's a cobweb spider and they're not going to be able to get in your blanket they're not strong enough a uh, wolf spider maybe but mm, highly improbable just a spider getting in your bed in general is highly improbable and unlikely um they've got to be a strong spider to lift that blanket you know, the sheets. but if it were to happen the mechanism of their biting is so improbable that they would have to have been upside down where you were to roll onto them and their fangs were just right there to bite you that way. Because you can't roll on them and then they turn around when you rolled on them and then they bite you. And they can't turn their fangs out. So it just doesn't work like that. Um, um, the, the brown recluse bite myth thing up here stems from uh, most in almost 90 percent of the time it's an infection of some sort 99 percent of the time uh skin infection bacterial infection uh some sort of response to to a bug bite you know anything like that um spider fangs are actually antimicrobial they don't transmit disease they don't carry bacteria on them they're very clean surprisingly i i never knew this i thought i just learned this about a month ago um but they are very clean they have a, a coating of protein that is antibacterial so even if it did bite you you're not going to get an, a secondary infection from a spider bite extremely rare um, bugs however are not clean uh, especially when biting flies like horse flies you know or mosquitoes you think about it they just bit something else most likely and then they bit you and they're transferring what you, they just bit into you yeah no 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 uh, hard pass on that one so um the the harmless as a fly saying is is totally a sarcastic saying it is it is false um it's harmless as a spider 
not as a fly. Uh, Alaska has, I can't even count how many species of fly that do actively hunt for you and will bite you. And a lot of them have um, um, anesthetic properties in their saliva and you don't feel them bite you like a mosquito. Um, they have no seams, black flies, um, white socks, um, biting gnats, biting midges. We've got so many different things that'll bite you. Um, horse flies. Um, all of these things have the ability to give you a secondary infection, transmit, or introduce. Um, it could either be on them already, or it, like Staphylococcus is already on your skin. It's already present on your skin. You get a little, you get a little bug bite that you never felt and you don't see it, you, you can't clean it, right? Um, and it just so happens that there might have been Staphylococcus bacteria in that area, and this is actually very probable, more so than being bit by a spider in your bed. Um, getting a staph infection because of a bug bite is very common. Even just getting a staph infection from a, a paper cut, um, Scraping your leg on a rock, anything can get you can get a staph infection from anything. Um, it's more common down in the states than it is up here in Alaska. It's more common in humid climates, uh, in cold, arid areas. Um, but it still is present and it still does happen. But those types of injuries does not mean that you should already, you know, oh, it was a spider. It was not a spider. Um, it, it was a brown recluse. It was not a brown recluse. The brown recluse spider doesn't even do that when it bites you and it venomates you. That is 90% of brown recluse bites, nothing happens. They heal on their own, absolutely nothing, uh, no side effects, nothing goes wrong, even if it's an envenomation. Only 10% actually have any sort of mild reaction, whereas they have, you know, maybe a little ulceration um, that it heals on its own. Um, Or, or, you know, response where it just is painful and, and just gives them a headache and nausea for a good amount of time. They feel sick and you can, you know, kind of have flu-like symptoms, but it goes away not that long. And out of those 10%, only 1% of that 10% of the 90% actually have these necrotic um, injuries that you hear about and see about and and there are so glamorized and, and crappy spider articles with like, oh, this spider did this to me. No, uh, bacteria did that to you, actually, which is way more common than the spider biting. Um, but we've got a lot of people, I deal with it all the time, we've got a lot of people that, that they see that necrotic, necrotic injury or the necrosis occurring, and they just automatically blame a spider. It was a hobo, it was a brown recluse, it was a black widow. Um, it wasn't. Um, I always tell everybody, if you ever see an injury on your skin, no matter how small, like, and if you, especially if you don't know where or what happened, clean it. It was probably a bug, you know, it could have bit you, and you don't want that to get infected. So a little bit of alcohol, boom, you're good to go. Clean that. You can go do what you were doing and not have to worry about a brown recluse biting you. Um, so in my group, I've had, uh, oh man, I wish there was a counter, but I would have to say roughly five to 10,000 pictures shared in my group and never has been a brown recluse. Um, there also have never been a Hope Spider post. Um, I have had black widows posted in the group. Um, so black widows are one thing. They are me medically significant. And it is one thing that you do need to worry about up here in Alaska when it comes to spiders. But that's more so in the Juneau area and further south, uh, southeast of that area as that Alaskan panhandle area does touch into the uh, Western black widow range. Um, So they have been known to come up every every now and then in shipments. Um, we get them in produce, even bags of grapes, unfortunately, because um, they're usually from California. And um, most of the times, the the grapes have been sprayed with um, non harmful uh, um, 
neurotoxins that affect spiders and insects and you know, nothing nothing like humans or anything um but it's it's a treatment that makes these spiders slowly die and they're very confused and disoriented and they might i would not pick one up because who knows what they're doing then they might just bite you randomly and you don't want that to happen especially in a foreign spider and you know so if you do ever find a, a black widow in your grapes which i am going to say this if you do find a black widow in your grapes please do kill it um we do not need it up here we we know that they do come up here we don't need specimens um they are technically at, at i don't want to say technically but they are loosely invasive because uh, they are coming up here and they do impact the other populations um but it's if they're in the grapes my reasoning more so for killing it is to put it out of its misery because the neurotoxins and you don't want it to possibly enter somebody else or, or you know um lay an egg case and then boom you've got you know who knows so dispatch it um i don't like talking about killing spiders uh but sometimes it does have to be done um one of the one of the guys that I learned a lot from is actually an exterminator. So, a very 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 knowledgeable exterminator from from uh, down in the south there. Um, um, so the myth that spiders bite you is it, it doesn't happen. Only if you are causing a spider harm will it respond and bite you back. So if you're holding a spider, you don't have any reason to worry for it to bite you unless you are you want to cause it harm if you want to cause it harm it's going to bite you um if you are intruding on their home like their nest or their hiding nook or just their general uh home area or while they're eating um they could get defensive uh, especially my my wolf spider up there uh she she's ferocious she's very defensive she's not aggressive she's not aggressive okay she is defensive and all spiders are defensive, not aggressive. They don't want to be messed with, but they will fight back if it if they have to. They're not gonna leave their home, you know, and have to go build a whole new one if they can, you know, if they can't help it. If they can do something about it, they're they're gonna do something about it. Um other myths about spiders, I guess, are um these are very simple ones. Daddy long legs is, is one. Um, so in my group, I teach people that the daddy long legs is not a spider. It, it's not. It is an arachnid, but it's not a spider. Um, the myth of this daddy long legs here, you can see they have the picture. Uh, um, you got the crane fly, the pupae, the falsidae, the cellar spider, and then the harvestman, the apuleones. Um, the only one that is a spider is the falsidae, and it is not called a daddy long legs, it is called a cellar spider. Um, we need to start calling them by their names, and we need to, everybody needs to drop the daddy long legs nickname. Who knows where it came from, why it stuck, whatever, but it's there, it's, it's stuck, and it's really annoying. Um, when people say daddy long legs, it's like, which which insect are you being respected or what are you talking about which one does it fly or does it have one body segment you know um the pilidae when they are in adult form they don't have mouths they can't eat um their larval stage is called leather worms and they cause those spots in your yard that a lot of people blame on a dog um dogs dog pee does still do that but if you don't have a dog and you're getting those spots there's a good chance you have these leatherback worms in your in your yard and they're eating roots of your grass and, and they are undeveloped brain flies. Um, False day, we do have up here last year, they are not so common and we are getting more of them. We've been getting Crossophysia lioni, uh, the tailed cellar spider, which is found almost everywhere in the, the equatorial regions, um, but not so much in the northern hemisphere, but they are definitely taking a foothold in Alaska and they're not having issues um and we've got harvestmen are everywhere these these guys are all over the world everywhere not have fangs um they are not venomous um they're not spiders they are 
picture here. Um, they have little claws in their faces, and these claws are able to move only out and then back to where their mouth is. So the, it it's really to pick something on the ground and go straight to their mouth. It's it, they're used for scraping and picking, um, but there's no that um there's no secretion of any venomous protein or anything like that. Uh, and they're mainly just scavengers. Um, Silver so spiders have venom. They're not harmful to humans or whatever. So here you can see the the spiders here. Spider fangs. When it comes to tarantulas, they usually go forwards and backwards versus a true spider, which go in towards each other and creates a pinching. Um, the uh, reasoning for this is how they eat, how they just just evolutionary versus a tarantula, which they rely on sheer power, where spider relies on grabbing or using webbing um, evolved tools. Uh, in this picture, you can actually see the cholesterol teeth, and these are actually little evolved teeth that they'll use to help clean and preen themselves um, or to watch your food, uh, to grind it. Like once they've injected the venom and the digestive proteins, they'll use these teeth to, to kind of grind and squish and make more holes so the juices flow faster into their, their mouth, the feeding port. I don't know the name of that yet. I haven't gone that far to macro and more basic um separating male and female is pretty obvious in all spider male jobs when i call them i tell people who's, if it's got boxing gloves it's a male uh, big boobies a female it's just faster that way <laughs> um the myth about you're always three feet away from a spider is technically a truth, uh, but it's not necessarily just spider. It's you are always three feet away from an arachnid um, or an invertebrate specifically. Um, I don't know about other spider myths. Not really any good ones on here on this broad one. Um, but most, it's about 80% of spiders on Earth are less than three millimeters. So me sitting at my computer right here, I've got a wall right here. In that wall, there's probably 30 or 40 spiders that you won't see even if you got a flashlight out. You'd have to get your microscope or your, your magnifying glass and actually really look for them. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, springtails, you know, globular springtails or, or the uh, oblong springtails, uh, little tiny, itty bitty little insects. And these little spiders. Um, yeah, so the, about 80% of spiders on Earth are three millimeters or less. Uh, that's pretty crazy, uh, especially considering how many spiders that you already know are there that are not that small. <laughs> but that 80% out there, it's like, wow, yeah. They're everywhere. They are a very successful organism. Um, we're gonna touch up on here. Do that. Um, jumping spiders, I'm not too good with. Go away. I've been learning about jumping spiders a lot. Uh, um, let me go to the last spiders. I strictly. Uh, brought up a lot of brown recluse stuff strictly because, um, you know, it's one of the bigger topics that have been going on in my group over the summer here. Um, but trying to think of something else, we've touched up all, all the subjects that I've already wanted to talk about. But I guess, uh, how about question time? Let's stop for more questions. Anybody got more questions? Okay. 
introducing you know themselves to the the spider world recently and and they used to be scared and and now they're starting to not be anybody out there that's that's like that i want to share their experiences and or how they can get over their fear a little more easily Um, I'll chime in really quick, Keith. I, um, I've never been particularly afraid of spiders. So I've always taken them outside and whatever. Um, my children were a little bit of a different story. They was like, oh, kill it. Um, but my son the other day noticed a web above his bed and he's got a tiny little black spider. I don't know what it is. Um, I've never gotten close enough to figure it out. I've actually taken it outside a few times and it always comes back to the same spot. And so I noticed it up there and I left it alone, um, but it's kind of right above his head and I didn't say anything to him. I just kind of let it be. And he said, hey mom, I have a, I have a spider web over my head. And I said, oh, interesting he said yep that's probably why i don't have any more bug bites what a friendly spider ah. and so i you know just the way and of course he's not he's seven he's not on facebook but the way that uh clearly it's made a difference in the way that i've talked about spiders and he's catching on so i'm grateful for your information and for the for the group i think it's just been really positive for a lot of people so there's my there's my little story well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm, I always like to hear when somebody, you know, has, has been helped through, you know, not, not just my group, but just being exposed to the positive aspects of spiders. You know, it's, it's a lot of the, I encourage my members to talk positively and comment positive comments so that other members that don't necessarily talk about them or, or, you know, they just browsing all the time, they see those comments and over time you know it's exposure therapy um the more you expose yourself to positive aspects of something that you're scared of you're going to start seeing it in a different you know a different light i'm like wow maybe that's not as scary as i thought it was and, and you're gonna have your other half of your brain still be like oh it's still scary it's it's still creepy you know i mean i've been doing this for for years and um like I will still fall asleep thinking about spiders and I think about spiders all the time and it doesn't scare me whatsoever. But when I had to go down in that crawl space looking for the brown recluse that were supposedly there and they were all Tegenaria domestica, I was really overwhelmed because I wasn't expecting 150 to 200 of them all over. Um, that was that was a true test of my my fear there and it was it was for a brief second it was like run away get out of here but you know the knowledge part kicked in it's like they just want to hide from me they're they don't know what i'm down doing down there i'm not as long as i'm not interrupting them there's nothing that they're gonna do um so when i was down there the whole time they were just they would just sit in their webs of course because i'm not disturbing them unless i would i had to be very careful because they were everywhere and I, I was stepping on webs um i they were everywhere down there um but they were very successful population that's for sure um so successful that they were starting to eat each other uh there were so many of them down there um so they might actually take themselves out in the future if, if that person isn't able to get that problem um, taken care of like I had suggested I hope they did um, but that was that was a true test for me and and overwhelming uh, but I decided hey I'm gonna take one of these females and I took the biggest one I could find and I brought her home and you know I let her crawl on me I, um, that was in that was the, the the article of the newspaper was was, was her on me and that's girl i got from that house but she has actually passed away from old age so here she is she has passed away from old age and of course not gonna be able to focus very well but yeah she just sat down and, and that was it stopped eating 
you know, the works. She, she, if anybody's on here, remembered I made a post on my group about her laying a, a little egg case of five eggs. That should have been my clue that it was her time. I'm, not only that, but she was the largest one that I found there at that crawl space. Um, so she was definitely at her old age. Um, and the barn tunnel spiders, can, the females can live for seven years. So she's probably six years old. And they said that that's been there that crawl space area has been cleared off. Um, then nobody's gone in there uh, for 10 years up till six months ago when just some things have been put down there. And that's when they discovered all the spiders. So uh they've been there for a long time and yeah she was the oldest one and and yeah there were some clues that she was gonna pass um but yeah my uh uh my view of them in that crawl space was it, it wasn't you know it was a brief moment of fear but it was more an appreciation of how they were able to establish themselves so so successfully down there it was amazing like holy cow you don't you guys don't have any food but you were able to do this you created your own ecosystem essentially to to be able to eat and do what they need needed to do and um, they're pretty intelligent and we don't give them the, the credit that they deserve for their intelligence um, um but yeah like when it comes to like if you got a spider above your head um Especially if it, in your circumstance there, you've got this spider that keeps reoccurring in the same spot. Um, the chances are if you are putting a spider outside and it, there is one in that same spot, it's a different spider. It just smelled that web and followed that webbing. Um, it is using that spider web again. Um, spiders do repurpose web sometimes in some, some cases. Like in the, the barn bottle weavers, I found a bunch of males and some of the females' webs where there was no female and the male was sitting there waiting in the entrance as if he was waiting for his food, like it was his web. So I've seen, you know, they steal webs sometimes. Um, not all species, it doesn't happen all the time, um, but it does happen. Um, but if you've got, you know, you've got spider reoccurring above your head, it, you're gonna have to clean off the web because the webs have pheromones and they're following that smell of the pheromone. Um, all spiders leave a trail of silk that is laced with pheromone uh, wherever they go. So other spiders will follow that. Um, that's how the males find the females. That's how other males find other males to, to fight it out when they are on female turf. Um, yeah, that's also how they find they wear their way back to burrows, like wolf spiders. When they go out hunting, they find their little scent trail, and that's how they go back home. Um, so you would have to essentially destroy the web and clean that area and remove the smell of the pheromones. You won't get a spider there again. Um, but you can just simply relocate that spider into a, a corner of the room or even under a dresser or in the cupboard, um, bathroom, anywhere like that. And it'll be okay. It shouldn't go back to that spot because it doesn't smell something there. So my thought is that there are males going back to the same spot where a female probably well, you know, probably was previously living at. Um, but yeah, no cause for concern whatsoever. Uh, be a different story if it was like a bee's nest. But yeah, no spiders worry about here. Hmm. Well, with that, Keith, this might be a good time to kind of wind it down. I think we've all learned a lot. I know that I have a better sense of how to identify spiders, you know, and what I might Bug be Bug your friend, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> takes a lot. So we really appreciate it, and if it Takes a while to get used to bug guide, but when you sit down, you have spare time. Yeah. And if you aren't a member already, you should join the Spiders of Alaska group. That's another way I've been learning so much. So I'll look forward to more spider programming at the Nature Center, too. Yeah. They're pretty great. So, all right. Well, thank you again, Keith. And all right. I wanted to show some of my spiders, but I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see them. Hmm. Like, we can. I know somebody wants to see my, my Hogna, the Carolina wolf spider. That I'm sure is. 
He's a looker. That was my favorite you showed to the group. There she is. So, let's see her there. So big. <laughs> so that's a, yeah, she's a big girl. This is one of the, uh, like a, one of those smaller, um, ramekin or petri cup kind of thing this is a ramekin um her legs will completely enclose over that i mean that's my finger and that's her abdomen so she's a big girl um she doesn't like it when i breathe on her though i can show you guys my brown recluse but he's a little He's fast now that he's he shed. He he molted finally first time since I had him in July, and he is now a um, a penultimate male, which means he is second to last molt. So one more molt will be his final life. Um, he won't molt after that; he'll pass away. Um, I have I have four. Black Widows. Um, one of them is a, a, an American Black Widow, uh, Latrodectus mactans. She's up there. I don't know if you can see her. She's this big bulb. Then I've got the Mexican. She's a beauty. This is a Mexican Black Widow. She's large. Okay, let's see your markings. Oh, terrible. You can kind of see those red stripes. There's so much web in there. Uh, this is one of my least favorite to feed because every time I grab the container or try to open it, he just runs right to the top. Or she, I mean, just like that. And wants to just run out when I'm feeding him. Her, dang it. Um, but this is a Costa Rican wandering spider. Stenidae. Um, they look like Phonutria. Phonutria are the Brazilian wandering spider, which people know of as you know the, a very, very venomous spider that gives you a, a painful erection to where you have to go to the doctors. Um, one of the more interesting ones that I have here is what uh, she's a Cupenius chiapinensis. She's really hard to see. She's just hiding out. I don't know. You might be able to see her butt right there. You can see that, that little ball. Ball is her butt right next to that first leaf. Um, she is a lookalike of the red-faced um, Brazilian wandering spider. Um, but she is actually harmless, completely harmless spider. Um, she has been mistaken for a Brazilian wandering spider in shipments of bananas all over the North American you know, everywhere on North America continent, even in Canada. Um, they are the ones that live in banana plantations. The Brazilian wandering spider, you're never going to find in your bananas because they do not live near banana plantations, except for one plantation, and those locals eat their own bananas. They don't export them, so you're never going to see one. Um, so that there's a case in Ketchikan where a family found a Brazilian wandering spider and their bananas. I actually looked into that a bunch because I was like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And it was one of these girls, a uh, 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 red-faced banana spider. Um, yeah, I've got a few of them. And uh, got Beethoven, my brown recluse here. Who's very, 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 very fast now. I keep him in a locked, super locked lid. He's the only one that I'm worried about getting out in the house because he can live forever outside. Angle this so that you can see. Oh, it's so difficult to do this. 
this camera angle and I don't want them running everywhere. That's a shedding. That's a shedding right there. The molt uh, scientific name would be exuvia. There he is. That is a brown recluse. Yeah. I'm not going to get them to move too much. But... You know, uh, the only thing I can say about owning a brown recluse is that they are very boring. Very, very boring spiders. They, uh, the only time of excitement is actually watching them eat. Um, they, the Loxosceles, I have um, some from Africa, Spain, and South America, also like Sumilia. I also have an Arizona desert recluse. They're not recluse spiders. They're, they're called brown spiders, the Loxosceles species. Um, not all of them are venomous, uh, just the brown recluse, Loxosceles recluse is that I have. Um, the others, though, they, they don't like to just sit like the brown recluse does. The brown recluse likes to sit in, in one spot. Um, that's why they are very hard to find. Um, they don't go in your shipping. So as soon as you move your shipping box, they run away. They don't want to be in there. Um, but the all of them but the recluse are always out of the web, just hanging out, waiting for their food. They are actually active hunting spiders. They're not sitting, hiding, in, like the lox of the recluse. So they, those are more entertaining than the brown recluse, which I, I thought it would be the other way around. Um, but yeah. I, I encourage somebody, if you want to own a spider, to get a jumping spider. Start with a jumping spider. Um, they're cute. Kids love them. Um, they're fun to hold. Um, make sure when you are holding them, you hold them close to the ground, or, and you do not lose them, because you can lose them very quick. Um, they, they jump very fast, but, but kids love jumping spiders. My son, one of his first words is spider. Um, he's got a Lucas the Spider plushie. Um, and he loves coming and looking at my spider. So, uh, you know, I've got my Spiders Alaska poster there. Um, a picture, a picture that I got from Kevin Weiner of a brown recluse. You know, my got my collection of spiders and stuff. And so, I try and keep it so that he is, you know, he, he is still interested in spiders. Because I'd like to pass this down to him and and you know have him help other kids. You know, not uh -oh. be scared of spiders when he gets to be the age. You know. Um, but he's only two right now, so he gets older, he's going to be holding spiders and bringing them up to other kids. And like, oh no, it's just fine. And so maybe some other kid will do that to him one day, and, and they'll become best friends. Who knows? <laughs> but um, yeah, this was this was a lot of fun. So no, no, maybe we can you. do it again. No, thank, thank you. Well, hey, thank you for sharing your spiders with us. And I oh, you, maybe you should say something. If anybody wanted to buy one of those posters, how would they do that? Oh, um, so if you wanted to buy it, I have a very large one for sale. Um, it's $30. It's waterproof and tear resistant. Like you can you can still like really rip it, but it, you know, your kids can play with it. It doesn't wrinkle. Um, you can use a, a drawing uh like a dry erase marker on the back of it so you can do like little quizzes and such but i, I did a lot of thought to it um oh. but the sale of the posters the large are 30 mediums are 25 and then i've got these other smaller ones that i'm making more accessible so they're only five bucks um and for people like this like in this kind of a, a zoom meeting everybody who has a kid that's in this um i would encourage to get with Samantha there because I will give Samantha a bunch of posters to give to you kids for free. So um, try and spread out that spider knowledge for free and, and let people know that, you know, do what you love, you know, do it. I love spiders. I'm going to help. Hope everybody else loves spiders. Um, so yeah, posters, um, they can be found on the Facebook website of my Spiders of Alaska group on the announcements section. So you go into the announcements tab, and it should be right there. You'll see the, the poster and, and all that. Um, and you click on the uh, view more for the information. It'll take you directly to the link there. Um, and I'm trying with the proceeds of the posters to 
paper. <laughs> it's been a work in progress, but I'm trying to make calendars and it's going to be awesome. I've got these artist calendar um, project that I've been working on. I was trying to get it done last year. It didn't work out. COVID hit. Printing company couldn't work out. Uh, a couple artists backed out, but this year I actually have all the pictures. Um, so they are artist recreations of member photographs, and they are all pretty well known Alaskan artists. And one of them is actually uh, um, Peter Dunlop Shaw. Uh, some people might recognize that name. He was, uh, he's a very famous cartoonist he does political cartoons these days but you know funny ones um um amanda amanda mm, uh, where did that picture go amanda that does these i can't amanda rose warren um she's got one of them amanda rose warren she's been very popular lately um i've got a bunch and i'm trying to get those done that's been a crazy hectic thing but i want to get those done by christmas so hopefully I'll have these sweet Christmas calendars ready to go and, and ready for next year so you get exposed to spiders every month, even if you're not on the website. Awesome, awesome. Oh, oops. I'm pressing buttons already. All right. So thank you again for your time. And I think with that, it's time for everybody to go make some snowballs. Yeah, yeah, it's still snow. <laughs> All right. On here. Um, cool. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for being here.